Bonjour. I am the esteemed French oceanographer Robert Kahl, and today I am here to talk to you about wetlands. Ah, the salt marsh. Though it is only found along low energy coastlines, there is no lack of wildlife within. In fact, it is one of the most biologically productive ecosystems on the planet, as it provides shelter, moisture, and abundant materials for its inhabitants. It's a salt marsh! All life within the marsh, however, is dependent on rather mundane water movements, known as the tides. Along a sheltered estuary, that is, an area where fresh and salt waters mix, the tides create an ever-changing environment in which organisms must adapt to life both in and out of the salt water. Grasses are the first plant life to occupy the tidal shores in a marsh. As tides move in against the outflowing rivers, sediment suspended in the water gets transported along the shoreline or riverbank. As the tides flow outward back to sea, the sediments are deposited and caught up in the root system of cord grass. Specifically adapted to saltwater environments, these halophytic grasses thrive. Cord grass and other grasses of the genus Spartina are adapted to living in badly aerated soils containing little oxygen, a specific condition of the saturated sediments in the tidal zone. Sediments build up over time and the grasses grow to occupy the new tidal land. As more and more time passes, the grasses grow and become the most numerous plant life along the shores of the estuary. Intricate drainage paths develop within the grasses, allowing the water to flow deeper into the marsh and create further shelter from oceanographic processes. Eventually, the growth of the marsh slows as it matches the tidal regime. The tall grasses and slow-moving tidal pools provide shelter for all forms of life. Most of it cannot be seen by the human eye. Billions of bacteria and algae thrive in the shallow solar heated waters, providing food for larval crustaceans and insects, which in turn provide food for young fish. Waterfowl, such as plovers, gulls, loons, and swans, head to the marsh for grazing and often for raising young. Mammals, such as mice, weasels, and raccoons, find shelter among the salt marsh as well. Yeah, he's not moving, he's pissed. Look lively! Oh, look okay. His claws right at the snatch. Let's stick something in there. The salt marsh serves as a barrier between terrestrial and marine processes and life. Specifically, the salt marsh filters toxins out of the waters before they reach the open ocean. Nitrogen, a limiting factor for plant growth and also commonly found in agricultural fertilizers, flows into rivers through runoff and travels seaward. Excess nitrogen in an ecosystem can cause eutrophication, a process in which large algal blooms rob the ocean of dissolved oxygen and cause dead zones. In salt marshes, special bacteria use the nitrogen in an anaerobic respiration, removing it from the water supply and releasing it in its most benign form as atmospheric nitrogen gas. The salt marsh serves as a physical buffer against storm surge and high seas. Like a sponge and like a cushion, Salt marshes absorb the force of ocean storms and reduce the power of the storm surge and also its propagation. In summary, the salt marsh is dictated by the tides which influence its formation and biological production. Longshore drift, wave propagation, and wave convergence create spits, barrier islands, or bays which provide the low energy coastline necessary for salt marsh development. Additionally, the salt marsh protects the land from storms and the oceans from toxins. Bonjour. <laughs> Hello.